On today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews, I'm going to show you guys a classic cocktail that's perfect for any celebration, give you a rundown on its very long and complicated and somewhat mysterious history, and show you how to make my preferred spec for a delicious classic. The French 75 on today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Hey there, hi there, ho there, my name is Michael. Welcome back to Mike's Hard Reviews. It's great to have you guys here today. I'm a bartender and mixologist from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and today we're gonna to take a look at the classic cocktail, the French 75, which was not only not always known by that name, but not always the cocktail that we know it as today. The exact origin of the French 75 is a little confused and muddled. It's not very well documented who came up with the original concept for the drink. But we do know that it has ancestral roots in a cocktail called the Champagne Cup, which was popular in the late 1800s. This was a champagne cocktail that featured champagne, lemon juice, and sugar served with ice. And this sort of gives us the genesis of the beginning of the French 75 because in certain areas, gin is added to it as an additional component of its flavor. However, that predates the era of cocktail mixology as we know it. It's not until the 1920s, during Prohibition era cocktail mixology, that we start to see the French 75 take form. However, it looks a lot different than it does today. The first time that the French 75 is in print, it is actually printed only as the 75 cocktail, just the number 75. And it's a combination of Calvados, or apple brandy, absinthe, grenadine, and gin, sometimes with dashes of lemon juice added to it. Remember, the 20s predates the existence of the modern sour style cocktail, so we're not seeing large pores of citrus, it's more or less an accent to the original cocktail. Now, these first versions of the 75 appear in two different writings, both appearing in 1922. Henry McElone's The ABCs of Mixing Drinks and Robert Vermeer's Cocktails, How to Mix Them. These are both very different cocktails from what we know as a French 75 today, but they do have the same sort of roots in their zenith of creation, the same kind of inspiration to a certain extent. It wouldn't be until 1927, however, that we see the French 75 take not only that specific name, but also its original, or rather its modern, uh, ingredients list. In 1927, a man by the name of Judge Jr. writes a book called Here's How. In that, he lists the recipe for a French 75, the first time that the cocktail appears in print under the name French 75. What's fascinating is actually that the implications of this recipe in particular describe the French 75 as being built as a variation of a Tom Collins, which is another classic cocktail that we haven't talked about yet. But in general, it is a lengthened version of a gin sour using club soda making up most of its body, served in ice or uh, in a highball rather than up in a coupe. This is fascinating because in the modern day, as we'll talk about, that's not really how we prepare French 75s anymore, but it was the long-standing version of the cocktail that existed for quite some time. Following its publishing in 1927, the uh, recipe was rewritten and re- published in 1930 by Henry Craddock in his book, The Savoy Cocktail Book. And The Savoy Cocktail Book was a widely popular, one of the most successful, if not the most successful cocktail books ever put to print. So we see the French 75 become a widely popularized cocktail at that time because of its appearance in that work. But it's important to know why it gets that name, why it's finally come to this point of the French 75 as we know it. The name French 75 comes from uh, world soldiers in World War I uh, who were fighting uh, in the French combo French-American forces and would give toasts to French 75 millimeter cannons that kept aircraft safe during their missions. <laughs> a truthfully, badass name. <laughs> that inspiration, that folk story behind the creation of this cocktail and its preparation persist. Up until today, that combination of gin, lemon juice, simple syrup, and champagne has become the absolute notion of what a French 75 is. It's kind of fascinating because even though that recipe list has actually persisted, its preparation has changed ever so slightly. Variations of the cocktail do exist, mostly in how it's prepared. There's a cocktail known as a champagne cocktail, which is another classic that we have yet to talk about. But it and the French 75 share a lengthening with champagne, even if there is a base spirit, or what we would typically think of as a base spirit being used in its place. Over the years, the preparation of the French 75 as a variation on a Tom Collins with ice in a highball uh, has moved away, and we are sort of seeing the champagne be favored over the gin and other ingredients. So larger pours of wine, really 
a wine cocktail, fortified with spirits, sugar, and citrus. That's the main way the cocktail has changed since the 1930s, but there are other variations, one in particular that I actually think makes a lot of sense. In some writings, the French 75 is written as a cocktail with a base of cognac rather than gin, which, if you ask me, actually makes a lot of sense. Gin's not French, but cognac very much is. These recipes exist and began to become popular around the same time as the gin-based recipes of the 1930s. And the first time that I could find one appear in writing actually appears in The Fine Art of Mixing Drinks by David A. Embury, our least favorite resident alcoholic here on this show. He writes a recipe uh, for a French 75 under the name French 75, notably, using cognac instead of gin in his book. Now, that's not the only time that that recipe with cognac appears in writing, but it appears by another name in writings of later authors. For example, there's a book known as The Jones Complete Bar Guide, written by Stanley M. Jones, and in there, there's a cocktail list that is a French 125, which is the same spec as a French 75, but using cognac as its base rather than gin. This is a pretty common way to refer to the variation, just to distinguish it from the French 75 using gin, and much like the French 75, also refers to a piece of artillery. <laughs> In this case, the Soviet tank-mounted 125mm cannon, the D-81T. And that is even more badass, yet somehow less French than the French 75. <laughs> In any case, despite its variations and its kind of long evolving history, moving away from a cocktail served up featuring ingredients that are nothing like what we would see today, the French 75 has become sort of the model cocktail for celebratory events. And you're probably going to see people serving it and drinking plenty of them around this New Year's. I'm gonna say, all these variations aside, I do have a recommendation for how you build this cocktail. If you're going to use cognac as your base spirit, I would recommend that you also use an actual champagne. Unlike other sparkling wines, uh, champagne specifically is yeasted. It has a very bready, toasty, yeasty flavor to it, which can be very, very nice. And even alongside gin, it works very, very well. But the sort of basiness and robust flavor of cognac, I think, is a better companion to it. So. If you're already flexing your pockets by buying a bottle of cognac for your French 75s, you might as well go a step further and get an actual bottle of champagne. <laughs> However, if you're going to use a different sparkling wine, which is totally acceptable, things like Prosecco and Cava are not only delicious, but also much easier to find than champagne, as well as cheaper, uh, go ahead and use gin. Cava and Prosecco are more traditional light grape wines with very sharp, fruity, citrusy notes, things like apple and pear and lemon. That's gonna pair great with the botanicals in the gin, as well as the citrus juice directly, rather than giving it a sort of uh, contrasting flavor. It'll be a nice complement there. So that's what we're gonna do today. I'm going to use a sparkling wine, and I'm going to use gin. So, long and convoluted history aside, let's go ahead and make a French 75. Please, we're not on plus. What is wrong with me? To begin, we're going to start with three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. We'll come behind that with three quarters of an ounce of freshly squeezed lemon juice. And then we're going to go with one and a half ounces of a London dry gin. Something with some pretty robust botanicals, but an important amount of citrus is gonna be very nice here. I'm going to use uh, Drum Shambo Gunpowder Irish Gin. This is phenomenal, phenomenal gin in a very sexy bottle. <laughs> That's everything for our base. Let's go ahead and grab some ice. As always, we're going to go with one cube whole and one cube cracked. We're gonna go ahead and cap that up, tap it down, and give that a shake for 10 to 12 seconds to chill and combine. Now before we do anything with that any further, we need to prep our glass. Go ahead and grab your glass of choice out of the freezer. I'm using a coupe today because I'm going to use a very small pour of a sparkling wine, and in general, when you serve sparkling wines uh, in smaller quantities, you do wanna use a coupe so that it can be drank quickly uh, so that carbonation disperses a little faster. This isn't quite so wide, so we'll still maintain some of our effervescence, but it'll be a little bit more balanced. Grab your sparkling wine of choice out of the fridge. This is putting foil all over the floor. <laughs> Fuck. The bottle in particular is a twist off, but whenever you're opening a bottle of sparkling wine, remember to hold the cap, but twist the bottle and let it very slowly unseal itself. Voila. We're gonna pour a very small amount of our sparkling wine into our glass just to get the effervescence started. And we'll grab our cocktail here and double strain that over our glass. Finish this off by topping it up with just a little bit more sparkling wine, just to a comfortable wash line. And now we can think about garnishing this. 
do that, I'm gonna grab a fresh lemon here, pull a nice long swath of peel, then we'll express that over top. Use that expressed peel for garnish and just lay that along the side like so. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a French 75. Alrighty, with our station cleaned up, let's go ahead and give our French 75 a taste. Cheers. Yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes, that is so nice. <laughs> the French 75 is kind of distinctly not a one note cocktail, but a cocktail with a very, very quick evolution. It sort of opens up on this semi-sweet yet still drying and very much acidic, bright uh, flavor of the sparkling wine. But from there, it sort of evolves into this this richer botanical complexity. The juniper and the other flavors and the gin come forward. And then they're accompanied by this, this backbone of that lemon and sugar combination that is so lightly candy-like, uh, especially alongside these other flavors that it it just wakens the cocktail up and it it's, it's just very, very refreshing. A summary, even, despite the fact that I would never really think of a French 75 as a summer cocktail specifically. The wine is definitely on the forefront, even in a smaller pour in a short glass like this. It's got a nice bold richness to it. And the carbonation being you know, prepared in a glass that's a little bit wider at the top has come off a little bit. So it's a bit more gentle on the palate and it allows it to be just like this very nice light amount of bubbliness that is just invigorating rather than sort of kind of shocking like it can be if you serve it in a flute. If you're using like a flute or a very tall glass, the opening at the top is very small. And that is designed intentionally to keep as much carbonation in the fluid as possible. Uh, that can be kind of intense sometimes. So preparing it like this means that it will off gas, not immediately, but faster. And that makes it slightly more approachable at times. Dry white grape skins flavor. And it goes over more into grape juice. The combination of the flavors in the in, in the prosecco I'm using and the the lemon and the and the botanicals and the gin they read kind of like sour oranges like a Seville orange almost. There's a kind of additional like like ghostly fruitiness coming out of this. I think it's because the gin I'm using it has a lot of grapefruit and lemon in it. Um, it's mostly like juniper and gunpowder tea, but the next biggest flavors I get out of it are uh, like alpine. Alpine flavors, uh, lemon, and the grapefruit. And that combo is making it taste very much like oranges. It's very fruity. That's really what it is. It's very, very fruity. Which is maybe isn't necessarily what you'll always find in a French 75, but this particular speck of it, I think, is, is amazingly so. It's really, really approachable. And I think, especially for people who aren't familiar with wine, this is a really great way to introduce into the concept of both gin, gin cocktails, and Prosecco or wine in general at the same time. This is just such a perfect, bright, and relatively easy cocktail to produce, especially if you're going to host people for a party for say, New Year's or graduation or somebody's birthday. They're phenomenal. This is a really, really easy sipper. And um, it's a lot of alcohol, so keep that in mind and drink them very, very slowly with plenty of water. <laughs> if your intention is, is to not get absolutely shit-faced like mine is today, um, in the description down below, I mentioned there are two recipes. The first of which is a classy version of the cocktail with a slightly smaller, you know, smaller proportion base and, you know, a limitation to how much wine you're using, um, served in a smaller up glass like this, obviously. And then there's one for family occasions where it's served uh, like a Tom Collins over ice in a very big highball glass because, let's face it, sometimes you just need to let loose and that's a really damn good way to do it. <laughs> But yeah, if truthfully, if you're looking for a very light, fruity, uh, both spring and summer friendly, but also celebratory um, co sort of cocktail, I think the first 75 is one of the best ways to go, if not the best way in any cocktail book ever written. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Let's go ahead and do a reading from our book, Crisp Toasts. We do one of these at the end of every single episode. And at the end of last episode, I do believe that we started a new section following the section on adventure. Yes, yes, in fact, we are reading from the section Adversity, and today's toast goes as such. You shall and you shan't. You will and you won't. You're condemned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. So let's all have a drink. <laughs> Cheers. You know, this video is coming out just before New Year's, 
I think that's how a lot of people are feeling about 2023. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Fuck it, let's get hammered and worry about it tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. If you guys enjoyed this episode, go ahead and click that like button down below and subscribe to catch more episodes. I make a new one every single Friday and then sometimes on Tuesdays. So if you want to be notified when those come up, go ahead and click that bell. Uh, I am also on platforms like Instagram and TikTok. I use TikTok the most. You can follow me there if you want or don't. Do what you want to. I don't really care. <laughs> As a note, this video is the last video that I'm releasing in the month of December. And while I will be making videos into January, I am pre-shooting them in December because I will be participating in dry January. So keep in mind that you're not going to get another longer scale video like this with breaking down the history of a cocktail, um, just some product reviews instead, while I prepare some content that is non-alcoholic and more history focused for halfway through January. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please remember to drink responsibly and have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.